Well, I want to welcome all of you to Providence Church this morning. I want to um, say a very special welcome to our first-time guests and visitors. If you are visiting us for the first time, just a couple quick um, notes for you. We do have bathrooms located at the, the rear end of the gym, so if you just head out through one of the uh, through one of the back doors, you can you can make your way to the restrooms uh, outside. Also, we do have a offering box uh, um, located in the back. We're not passing the tray uh, at this present time, so there is a collection box. Uh, box back there for everyone. Just a real quick announcement before we get into some of the things on the bulletin. We do have several items in the back left over from the Easter feast. So if you, um, if you left anything behind, please check in the back and we'll have so, um, several items there um, that were left over at the, or that were left from the um, Prichelle's house. So in terms of announcements, just want to make sure that we, that we let all of the families of the church know that we do have our youth summer kickoff taking place May 2nd. It's going to be May 2nd at 1 p.m., over at the Calvi House, you have the, um, the address there. This this kickoff is, is going to be a uh, just like a pool party and barbecue where we can get to know the students. The students can be introduced to one another, and then we're going to be detailing the the summer uh, the summer calendar and all the events that are going to be taking place for the next several months. So you want to make sure that you come on May second at one p.m. Got that, Isaiah? May second, one p.m. There you go. All right. Um, other than that, we do have uh, Providence one hundred and one classes that are starting up. Um, pretty soon. So if you're new with us or you just want to learn more about the church to become a member, or if you're a longtime member and you just want to have a refresher in terms of some of the uh, distinctives of the church, we're going to be beginning that class here in the near future. It'll be taking place Sundays after service. So if you're interested in that, please speak to me or one of the other elders. We're just trying to gather uh, names of people that are going to be participating in that class so that we can plan accordingly. Also, our regular men's and women's meeting groups are, are um, the groups are continuing to meet for the next several months, and the details for, for when those meet are in your bulletin. That's all we have for this morning. Once again, we're so glad that you're here with us. So now let's go ahead and uh, prepare our hearts for worship. of the Lord Jesus Christ, please stand together as our God calls us to worship Him. Praise the Lord. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. The Lord be with you. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us turn and praise now as we join with one voice on page 8.
us pray. Heavenly Father, we do gather together in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, this morning. And we would ask, Lord God, that as we do, that your Spirit would be here, that we might worship you in a way that is fitting. Lord, that we would honor your name and ascribe to you the glory that is due unto you. And that you would remind us in your tenderness of your mercy and your grace towards sinners. And that you might lift up our heads that we would see Christ as altogether lovely and for us. This we ask through Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The scriptures teach us that if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But it also teaches us that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so to that end, let us look at ourselves and then look to God this morning for mercy. So hear now the covenant of your God, which he has commanded you to keep saying, I'm the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Have you fully obeyed the Lord in all that he has commanded? Have you loved the Lord with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself? Then confess your sins to the Lord, for with him there is mercy and abundant redemption. Let us confess our sins together, kneeling or bowing as you are physically able. Let us pray. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you that we have sinned against you by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not fully loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not always had in us the mind of Christ. You alone know how often we have grieved you by wasting your gifts, by wandering from your ways, by forgetting your love. Forgive us, we pray, most merciful Father, and free us from our sin. Renew in us the grace and strength of your Holy Spirit, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. People of God, lift up your heads and hear the good news of the gospel. As the psalmist said, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. As a minister of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of His word and promise, I can declare to you this day as you look to Christ alone, your sins are forgiven and you have right standing before God your Father who is in heaven. The peace of the Lord be with you. Let us stand in response to God's grace as we join together in singing.
Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament lesson today is going to come from Jeremiah chapter 25. Never mind, you can't always believe everything you read. Jeremiah chapter 25. We're going to pick up in verse 15. This is God's Word. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. They shall drink and stagger and be crazed because of the sword that I am sending among them. So I took the cup from the Lord's hand, and I made all the nations to whom the Lord sent me drink it. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, its kings and officials, to make them a desolation and a waste, a hissing and a curse, as at this day. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his officials, all his people, and all the mixed tribes among them, all the kings of the land of Uz, and all the kings of the land of the Philistines, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, Edom, and Moab, and the sons of Ammon, and all the kings of Tyre, and all the kings of Sidon, and the kings of the coastland across the sea, Dedan, and Tamah, and Buzz, and all who cut the corners of their hair, all the kings of Arabia, and all the kings of the mixed tribes who dwell in the desert. All the kings of Zimri and Elam and the kings of Media and all the kings of the north, far and near, one after another, and all the kingdoms of the world that are on the face of the earth, and after them the king of Babylon, he too shall drink. They, then you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, Drink and be drunk and vomit, fall and rise no more because of the sword that I am sending among you. The Word of the Lord. As we prepare this morning to hear the Word preached, please turn to pages 10 and 11 and we'll join in singing the Scriptures uh, that are found there. This is going to be a little tricky. You're going to have to turn the page here to get to your verses. Our New Testament reading and sermon text this morning comes from Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 31. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. 
And he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, Nothing. And he said to them, But now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, Look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, It is enough. And he came out and went, and as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and he prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The word of the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. We do ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, Mark Twain rightly said, Clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society. Uh, that is true indeed. Uh, in Marilyn Robinson's fourth book and her Gilead series, entitled Jack, we get the story of the adult life of the prodigal son, Jack, a prodigal of a Presbyterian minister. Uh, this son is the subject of much of her work, drives many of the stories in this particular series. And we meet him in this particular book in his adult life after a stint in jail and wanting to try and kind of pick up his life again and live in a manner uh, that might kind of put his past behind him, he goes uh, to what we would call like a thrift store and picks out a black suit. And immediately once he buys the suit and puts himself in it, he's mistaken for a preacher. <laughs> he looks apparently a lot like his father as far as profession is concerned once he wears these particular uh, this particular piece of clothing. And this map misapprehension uh, he goes along with for a while because the first person to mistake him is a young lady that he finds very attractive. He's able uh, to, to kind of get her attention and, and uh, speak with her, but after a while he regrets the wearing of these clothes. And so he goes back to the store and he trades them in. Uh, he trades in his preacher suit for one that's more fitting for kind of his station and and his lot in life, he picks out this you know, brown tweed suit, and according to the author, that has cigarette stains to match. And he says in his own mind, it was a relief as he puts the clothes down on the counter to put all his pretensions down on the counter with them. Well, eventually he gets a date with this young woman. And as providence would have it, on this date, some of his creditors that he owes money to spy him, and he has to begin running. Uh, to hope in hopes of escaping them. Uh, unfortunately, he can't outrun them, and he's beaten down pretty seriously, and these new clothes that he's just purchased are covered in blood. He strips them off, and he does so saying that he wants to dress as he actually is. He will go out from this point on dressed as a vagabond, as a bum. And he says as he's doing so, if clothes make the man, and so he has consigned himself to perpetually be shown forth to the world as he feels himself to be. Since he is a, is a bum and a loser, he wants everyone that sees him to know his station by what he's wearing. Any amount of trying to clean himself up has always made him feel like a phony. And since he can't change it, he wants his clothes to match it. Everything else, he says, would be a lie. And while at the risk of horribly mixing metaphors, here we go. Uh, in our text this morning, I want us to see first the cup of blessing. We've been mentioning this for several weeks now, 
one of the most staggering parts of the passion story, yes, is the crucifixion of Christ itself, but the events that precede that crucifixion that show us not only the manner and the ways of the Savior, but it also shows us those who surround him, even his closest friends, and, and their manner and their ways. Though we know G Judas is in the room, though we know now that Peter will betray him because our Lord has just told us, and while we know that those who are sitting around this table that we call the Lord's Supper will soon argue over which of them is the best, Jesus still serves to them what we call the Eucharist, a meal that is nothing less than a pure promise and a promise of good and of blessing. It's a meal uh, it, that in Jesus' hands, the, this bread and wine testifies to those who are receiving it, my body, my blood, for you. And in the structure of the meal, at least as it's told to us in the Gospels, we see that Christ has uh, uh, given the bread and then they eat the entirety of the meal. And it's after the, the meal that He takes the cup, as we're told in the Gospels and in Paul, after the supper. And He says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. That cup that's taken after supper, if you've ever sat through even a traditional Seder in our own day, you'll note that there's four cups of wine that are partaken of uh, different parts of the meal. They all have particular names. And Paul tells us specifically which cup this is. That This is the third cup of the Seder meal that Paul names as the cup of blessing. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The Bible uses this imagery of the cup in so many ways, uh, and surely in a way to detect and to tell us of God's blessing to His people. I mean, the most famous psalm, arguably in the whole of the Bible, and maybe one of the most famous passages in all of the Bible, Psalm 23, we love those portions when we are told that God prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. It's a testimony of God doing good to His people. When you have a cup that is filled by God, uh, that, uh, that, that speaks of goodness, it is this cup of blessing. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. And so when people speak in our day, and you see it all the time, whether it be through hashtags or cursive writing on pretty... Uh, 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 you know, tchotchke uh, artwork on the wall, you know, when it says blessed. Uh, what we mean by that and what the Bible means by that aren't always the same thing. Uh, but the Bible really is fond of and promotes blessing as something we should desire. In the Bible, blessing is the enlargement and favor of God on every part of your life. He enlarges your life in every possible way. And so the meal uh, that Jesus is eating with the disciples has been completed. And then he takes this cup out, this cup that is named for blessing. And he says, this is for you, a new covenant of blessing in my blood for you. But notice who receives it, the recipients of this blessing. Those who will, by the end of this very day, curse and spit while declaring that they have no knowledge of this man that they've never known Him. This embarrassment who's being paraded around naked before the watching community is too much for Peter to bear, and so he will deny even knowledge of his Savior. It's really hard to imagine getting much lower than this as far as just friendship and loyalty and goodwill is concerned. I mean, we all know that we have a certain amount of badness within us, uh, but this kind of treachery where one turns on a friend in the midst of their worst moments. That's the kind of thing that leaves a mark that you don't forget. And often, you don't forgive. I mean, we wouldn't do it, of course, but here is Peter doing so to God in the flesh, embarrassed to even know Him. Some of you will remember uh, Paul Tripp writes about an experience he had as a young man when they were going to a school presentation, and his mom was driving there. It was a presentation where students would present uh, particular things they had done, and parents were invited, and Paul Tripp kept saying on the way that he kept telling his mom, you know, you don't need to come. You know, not many parents are coming. It's not important. And uh, she came to find out uh, that all the parents were there except her, and when she questioned him why he didn't want her there, he told her, well, it was because she was fat. 
and he didn't want to be embarrassed in front of all of his friends. And what's interesting is he's writing about this in his 40s at the time. And he says it's one of the worst things uh, I've ever done in my whole life. And he still can't get over the shame of being treacherous to someone who loved him like that. And Peter is about to do something far worse to a man who's done nothing but be loyal to him. But that's what's happening here. Peter sees his Savior, and it's too shameful to bear the weight of it before the watching community. So he does not denies any knowledge of him. And Jesus, this night, will give him that cup and say, drink it. It's a promise, an assurance. It's a seal of God's favor and blessing to you. Peter, this is a promise that God likes you. It's for you. And that God will only do good unto you. Even as Peter will say of that same God, I don't know him at all. I mean, how is that even possible? When the law plainly says, we read it this morning, that the primary commandment, I mean, you can summarize the whole of it as this, is just love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and just do it all the time. If you do that, then you will have no sin, you'll be righteous before your Father who is in heaven. Not just to love Him here and there, but with everything that's in us at every moment of the day. And the Bible says if we don't do that, the opposite of blessing is promised to us. And I know that one, you know, uh, we, we, we focus on the New Testament culturally more than the Old Testament, and we also live in a culture that does not talk much uh, about the anger or the wrath or the judgment of God. But it's very clear in Scripture, as God says in the law, if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all His commandments and His statutes, then all the curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed you will be in the city. Cursed you will be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of the ground and the increase of your herds and the young flock. Cursed you will be when you come in and cursed you will be when you go out. So if that's true, if that's God's promise for disobedience, how is it that Peter, who's going to be the most disloyal, uh, at least seemingly, uh, of the, the remaining 11, moments from here is handed a cup of God's blessings and says, this is all promise for you. You'll notice the prediction of Peter's denial and the event of his denial are broken up. Jesus predicts it, and there's a conversation, a time of prayer, and then it takes place. And notice what happens in the middle between the prediction of Peter's denial and its execution, we see this other cup, the cup of curse. And the Bible is very clear that God, according to the law, does good to those who do good. And you really can summarize the law that way. I mean, you've read the Proverbs. You, you know what the Psalms say. You read uh, the, the book of Exodus or anything in Deuteronomy. It's very clear that if you want to be blessed, all you have to do is be obedient, which is... A pretty large task, as most of us have found out. But it also is clear that God repays those who don't obey. That He will give them their just desserts. As the psalmist said, For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as a shield. But the law of Deuteronomy also makes plain that if the, obey is, the, the law is not obeyed, that the very opposite of blessing comes, as we just read, the curse. But if you do what you're supposed to do, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, if you love your neighbors yourself, if you obey your parents, if you never lie or steal or kill, God promises you that you will find nothing but favor in your life. I mean, the law is good and true and holy, and those who keep it will have a good life, according to Scripture. That same section of Deuteronomy says, if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, if you're careful to keep all His commandments, the Lord God will set you high above all the nations. All the blessings shall come upon you. They will overtake you. Sounds like the psalm, right? Surely goodness and mercy will follow you, right? God's goodness will overcome you. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed you will be in the city and blessed you will be in the field and all of the things that would be cursed. Otherwise, every area of your life will be expanded and enlarged and God will do good to you. And here we have Jesus in the garden crying out to his Father. I mean, what should we expect for him? 
biblically, if you're reading the Bible literally, what should we expect if a faithful son who has been obedient to the Father cries out to him for help in his time of need? He cries out to a father who promises, if we, being earthly fathers, love to give good gifts to our children, how much more does the heavenly Father do good to those who ask? He cries to a father who has spoken of his son in nothing but glowing terms. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Or in the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Hear him. Jesus speaks of their relationships in, relationship in these terms. For the father loves the son. And he shows him all that he is doing. The father loves the son and has given all things into his hands. And so when we come to the garden in the darkness of this night and we hear the Son cry, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. What he asks, will it not be given? I mean, the one who is supremely loved by the Father, but more than that, won't blessing come to a Son who has always obeyed? The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. His ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He'll cut them off. But when the righteous cries for help, the Lord hears him and delivers him from all of his troubles. But here Christ is crying that this cup be removed. And what is this cup anyway? I mean, what is Jesus praying against? What is, what is he hoping that won't come his way? And we saw just before the disciples receiving a cup full of blessing. And then Christ asking that a cup not come upon him. And biblically speaking, it's clear what this cup is filled with. We read in Jeremiah even this morning, the, the prophet is to come to the nations with this wine cup, and he's to go to each nation in the world and force them to drink it. And he's told, he tells them, this is the cup of God's wrath. Drink it because of all that you've done to defame his name. Psalm 75, but, the God, but God is the one who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine, well mixed, and He pours out from it. And all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. God is pictured in heaven as having this cup of anger, right? Where He is, he is angry with those who have disobeyed His word, who have never honored him, who have been ungrateful to him, who has just simply ignored him. And the, the, the end of the world, we are shown that he takes this cup and he forces it to the lips of those who have denied him. A picture, of course, that is hard for us uh, in this day and age to imagine because of how we have remade God into an image that's more palatable for us. I mean, even in our own uh, literary mythology of our state, Grapes of wrath are in reference to this, these sorts of passages. This was a well-known metaphor in Scripture that God has a cup of wrath that He's going to pour out on the disobedient. It is a cup of curse. And only now can we begin to understand the prayer of our Lord Jesus when He's saying, Father, if it be Your will, just let this cup pass from Me. I mean, the unthinkable reality that God has a cup of wrath in His hand that He is about to force upon the Son. A Son who's done nothing but that which is pleasing in His Father's sight. A Son whom He loves. A Son who is crying out for help in His time of trouble, asking that if God would see fit to not allow this to take place. But God doesn't answer, not in the way that's requested. He doesn't hear the cry of his son, not in the way that he's desirous of. He refuses this particular pleading. He leaves him there, denying his request, and moments from now, he will treat him as an enemy upon the cross. The I never knew you of Peter is nothing compared to the treatment that Christ is about to receive from his own Father in heaven, who comes to him with a cup of curse and says, This is the old covenant, sealed in blood, filled with curse, take and drink to the bitter end. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So why? You'll notice then, one cup for another. 
As horrible as this story is, of course, and as profoundly repulsive as the scene is, and it is, it's the only reason that we're gathered here. I mean, without this story, uh, we could gather for a lot of things. Uh, you know, we could make a club and do some fun things. Uh, but to be gathered as a church is to be gathered because of this particular event. To sit here and speak of God's holiness and not tremble week after week. To sit here and believe that God loves us and is kind to us and desires to bless us in the end is all because of these events that have transpired. The reality, this reality teaches us so much about what modern day religion has sought to rid us of. The reality that Christ drinks from a cup of wrath teaches us something about sin, about our sin, about what our sin deserves. It teaches us about the overwhelming holiness of God. God really does hate sin. It teaches us about what really transpired on the cross. The cross is not just a sign of God's love, while it is. It's not just a sign that Jesus will have victory over death, while that's true as well. It's not just an example for us to follow, or the greatest sign of commitment that the world has ever seen. This is the truth of all of Scripture put on display, the truth being that we are sinners who deserve God's justice. But God in human flesh, who never sinned, who deserved only blessing, took the real wrath of God upon the cross Himself, so that you and my, I might not just escape death, and might not even just simply be forgiven, but so that you and I could, could be past a cup brimming with blessings, overflowing so much that we're going to have wine stains on our clothes and on the carpet, so that God could treat us as if we had always, every time, done what was right. So He can look at Peter dead in the eye and say to him, you're going to deny me, but I have prayed for you here a cup of blessing for you. I mean, do you see what is happening on the cross? It really is the end of the world as we know it. Truly the end of the world. If you want to see what the end times looks like, look at the cross. God will judge sin. How do you know? Because He judged sin in His Son on the cross. A fate so horrific that Christ Himself said, if there's any other way, don't allow this to happen to me. God said He will come to judge the world in anger by having them drink His curse. And there is Jesus drinking it on the cross and the cup that is forced against His lips that day now is empty. It's been poured out. It's gone. There's a reason that Christ, after He thirsts, takes a drink and says, it is finished. There's nothing left concerning God's wrath towards His people to drink. It's all been taken away, which means there's nothing left of God's anger for you. None of it. Not even at your grossest sins. Not even at the things that you can't get over or forgive yourself for. God is not in any way holding back some measure of punishment that He's going to pour out on you. It has all been poured out once and for all on a son who requests that a cup be passed from him. And the Father said, no, you will drink it to the end. There's no more wrath for deniers like Peter or doubters like Thomas or complainers like us. There's no more wrath for the greedy and the lustful and the ungrateful who come in repentance, leaning wholly on a Christ who has died for them. There's none left to be given. So now what? So try to fit into the new clothes that God has given you. I mean, you very much might feel like Jack in a black suit who's mistaken for a preacher, who's mistaken for looking just like his father, even though he knows inside he is dirty and he's nothing like his gracious father who's been kind to him. You might feel like a fraud. You might feel like they're not your clothes. They're the clothes of some really wealthy, together, obedient guy. And that's true. But they're yours now. And they're going to be yours forever, and you might as well get used to wearing them. And they're yours because Christ put on your filthy rags. He became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. If Twain was right, that clothes make the man, 
and naked people have little or no influence on society. I mean, that is true and false. Clothes do make us. And you have been robed in the very righteousness of Christ, but only because that Christ became naked and shamed in your stead. Steve Brown writes of an experience that he had. He says, I went to a banquet once where ties were required. Nobody had told me. A friend of mine saw me outside the banquet hall and said, hey, Steve, you don't have a tie. I have an extra one in my room. I'll be right back. Two minutes later, he handed me a tie, put it on, and I was acceptable. The interesting thing about the tie my friend gave me is that it was his best tie. All evening, people said to me, nice tie. (laughs) Not only was I dressed properly with a tie, I was dressed extravagantly with the best tie in the house. And that is what God has done to make us acceptable. He's given us the best clothes in the house, the very righteousness of Christ, end quote. So people of God, try and get comfortable with who you are. In God's eyes, you are as righteous as Christ himself. When you hear the words that he speaks over his son, this is my son whom I love, hear him. He speaks those same words over you. He has those same thoughts toward you. And it's not make-believe. Christ didn't die on the cross that we could sit around thinking that God still is questionable concerning us. Christ died in your stead so that you could know once and for all that God views you as beloved as He views His own Son. As one author writes, but then again, imputation is inherently brazen. It is the idea that God looks upon us knowing full well the depths of our dishonesty, greed, and fear, and decides that in Jesus Christ, we are the best thing He can possibly think of, His holy and righteous children, able to stand before Him without an ounce of shame. See what love the Father has given, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. John says. And that is indeed what we are. And not just a part we play. On the level of empirical data, it makes no more sense to say that I am righteous, but it is as true as it gets. That because God doesn't pretend that we're righteous, He makes it so through our union with Christ who takes our filth in exchange for His goodness and what God has put together, let no one tear asunder. And that is pretty much the best thing I can possibly think of, he ends. As you come into this text this morning, and as we come to this table this morning, you should receive it for what it is. But as God hands you this bread and wine, he is handing you nothing but blessing. That that is your ultimate end. That God is now in Christ for you and not against you. And that is true despite your record. And not just your past record, you know, when you were bad before you cleaned yourself up and reformed. But even the sins you've committed this past week that look an awful lot like the ones from the week before and the month before and the year before that. That your righteousness before the Father is not dependent first and foremost on your performance. It is wholly dependent on what Christ has already done for you on the cross and what he has given you in that exchange. So may you wear those clothes and believe what God says about you when you come to this table. This body, this blood, for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the good news of the gospel. We ask, Lord God, that you would give us the grace to believe what you say. We so often live by sight, and we think that somehow uh, our lack of faith to believe enough to uh, see great things happen, but we can barely believe that we're forgiven because we know who we are. We see what we do. We hear what other people say. And yet, Lord God, your testimony over us is that we are your well-loved sons, holy in Christ, that we are your spotless bride, united to you forever because of what you've done for us on the cross. 
Lord God, we thank You that the cross does show us so much about Your character, that You really are holy and just. You really do care about sin. You really will avenge, Lord, Your honor. And yet in Your mercy, You have avenged that wrath upon Yourself in order that we might be made children of God forever. Lord God, may we believe this in such a way that it bears fruit in our life. May we believe, Lord God, that You consider us as righteous in such a way that we begin to reflect, Lord, what You've said about us. May You give us the grace, Lord God, to go forth from this place knowing and believing not only these things about ourselves, but about those sitting next to us in the pew that belong to our own household and those, Lord God, across the aisle who we may not see eye to eye with, that they are wholly righteous in Christ, beloved by You, worthy enough in Your eyes to send Your Son on their behalf. Lord God, we do pray this morning as a congregation gathered in Your name with the authority of Your Son, that You would be merciful, Lord God, to the nations, that You would draw every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation to Yourself, even as we read in the prophecy of Jeremiah this morning, Lord, this prophecy of wrath going to the four corners of the earth, and yet now in the gospel you have sent that same message of good news and forgiveness to every nation under heaven. May you draw them to yourselves, we pray. Be with those who have gone in your name to preach that word. Lord, they've given up much, houses and lands and the comforts of culture. And yet, Lord God, we pray that you would bless them in the life to come, but even in this life a hundredfold. We pray as well, Lord God, for our nation. We are grateful for the freedoms that have been afforded to us here. We're thankful that we can gather this morning without hindrance to hear the word preached. And we pray, Lord God, in your mercy that that would continue. That those who rule and have authority both on the local level and the national level would remember that they have been ordained by you, that you've put each one of them in their position and they're accountable to you. And Lord God, that they would do nothing that would hinder your church from Uh, operating freely and preaching the whole counsel of God. Lord God, do this for us, we ask. You have been so merciful to us for so many years. Lord God, we pray as well for our community. We ask, Lord, that the gospel would impact uh, the Temecula Valley. We pray for the churches around us who seek faithfully to proclaim your word, Lord, and to minister to your people. Bless them and Uh, expand them. Uh, We ask that you would come alongside their leadership and encourage them, provide for them. And Lord God, may you do the same for us, we pray. Be with the families of our church, provide for their needs materially and spiritually. We pray for our households, Lord God, that they would be places of comfort and refreshment and mercy. And Lord God, where there is turmoil, may you bring the balm of the good news, Lord. May there be a softening of hearts when we see ourselves for who we are and the gospel, Lord God, that you have forgiven the likes of us. May we be willing to once again forgive those who have hurt us. Be tender to those, Lord God, who may not see eye to eye with us. Lord God, we pray for the children of our church. We thank you so much for your sweet and precious promises to them. We ask, Lord God, that they would never know a day that they don't proclaim Christ as Lord. And yet, Lord, as well, if they should stumble along the way, even as we see of the great Apostle Peter this morning, that you, in your mercy, would give them the grace to rise again. That when we and they are faithless, that you would remain faithful. Lord God, we pray that you would take them beyond us in their faith and that you would use them, Lord God, to strengthen uh, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and to expand your kingdom. We pray, Lord God, for those who have financial needs among us, physical needs. We pray that our eyes would be open to them in generosity and mercy. We pray, Lord God, that you would provide work for those who need it, that you would provide, Lord, care for those who uh, um, need it as well. We pray for those who are physically ill and struggling, that you would be merciful to them. And as their body is weakened, Lord God, that you would uh, strengthen their faith that they would not lose heart uh, as they struggle. We pray, Lord God, for uh, the various concerns, Lord God, that uh, come to us. We pray for our leaders, uh, that you would give them wisdom in dealing with these things. 
And Lord, we pray most of all, Lord, that you would use us as a congregation to reach uh, out to those around us, to show mercy we're able, uh, to do our jobs well as we've been called to do. And Lord God, to enjoy the salvation that's been purchased for us and to so live that we freely give away ourselves as you have freely given to us. Lord God, you know our concerns, you know the needs uh, that we have and the fears that we have. And Lord, even those that go unnamed this morning, we entrust them to you as they concern our hearts. And we pray now, even as our Lord has taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us stand together as we respond to God's word, turning to page 12. People of God, we have this sure and certain promise that those who confess the name of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, He will confess their name before His Father who is in heaven. Therefore, dear Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. As we come to the Lord's table, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord. 
it is right and good and a joyful thing that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you. Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. And therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we praise and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Be seated. We do give thanks to God the Father that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, gave us this memorial until His coming again. From the night that our Lord was betrayed, He took bread, and when He had broken it, He said, This is My body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same manner, our Lord took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of Me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you do proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. As we come to this table this morning, even as the Apostle says, we're proclaiming Christ's death. And in that proclamation, we're proclaiming not just something about Christ, but something about us. That Christ has borne the wrath of God for all of your sins. And therefore, as you partake of this meal, you can know for certain there is no more wrath of God left for you. God is not angry with you. In fact, quite the opposite according to the Scripture that because you now bear the very righteousness of Christ, He is pleased. And all of those promises, all of those promises of the book of Deuteronomy that says, if you obey, if you obey, if you obey, all of those promises are yes and amen for you. Now, it may not feel like that yet. <laughs> but they are true of you. By faith, just as true it is, it is that you are righteous, so true it is that because you are righteous in Christ, at the end of your days, it will be nothing but blessing. God's favor, His cup running over, placed into your hand. And this bread and this cup that you receive today is a foretaste and a promise of that reality. That if these things are true of you, then that day will be true of you as well. You can know God's favor this morning because you can taste it. Christ in your stead. That's how much God loves you. So may you taste and see that the Lord is good indeed this morning. This table is set for all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth, who have been joined to His church, both in baptism and a profession of faith, and who are in good standing in those churches. And if that's you this morning, we invite you to come freely participate and partake with us today. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in thanks for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, and in the joy of His resurrection, and in the blessed hope of His coming again, we come now and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice as we come to the table of our Lord. Amen. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. On the night our Lord's betrayed, He took bread and He gave thanks. Heavenly Father, we do thank You. Lord, we thank You for all the gifts of this life, but most especially we thank You for the gift of Your Son in our stead. Lord God, we thank You that You so loved us that You sent Your only begotten Son for us. And we would ask, Lord, that as we partake this morning of this meal, that by Your Spirit You would bring us all of the blessings of Christ's broken body and shed blood, that You would feed us on Him this day. Lord, He is our life. And we need, Lord, to be strengthened by Him. So grant us this for Your own name's sake and for the good of Your people. In Christ's name, Amen. After He had given thanks, He took the bread and broke it, saying, This is My body given for You. And He gave it to His disciples as I now minister in His name. Do so for You.
Hear now the voice of your Savior. This is my body given for you. Take and eat. In the same manner, our Lord took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant my blood, given for you. And he gave it to his disciples, as I now minister in his name. Do so for you. People of God, hear now the voice of your Savior. This is my blood poured out for you. Take and drink. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you body and soul to life everlasting. Amen. Let us stand as we're dismissed in the peace of the Lord this morning.
Receive now your God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.